Invading the internet covering web 2.0, coast to coast, worldwide, and everywhere in between. This is where you put the social in social media. We are Social Blade. Social media. Social Blade. The current frontier. <laughs> These are the voyages of the Social Blade Show. This continuing mission to explore strange new sites, to seek out new blogs and new Twitter applications, to boldly tweet where no one has tweeted before. That was my, that was, you gotta, that was the cue for the trumpets. You're supposed to play the trumpets at this point. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Social Blade Show. This is uh, episode number 57. As I pause to make certain that nobody corrects me. Episode number 57 of the Social Blade Show. And uh, I am here as J.D. Rucker, even though you can't see me currently. You're a blinking telephone, and I'm Jason Ergo, uh, a picture. I'm Aaron Ryan. Hey, Jeff. I'm Jeff Kreider. <laughs> Shut up. <laughs> <laughs> it's just your life. <laughs> yeah, and there's know. lots of... And everybody is mobile, so you can see no one, but we're all here. We had to be here tonight, this, this beautiful, wonderful Thursday, because it has just been an absolute jam-packed week of social media um, entrenchment. It, it's been like a nuclear social media week. It's been, it's been phasers are set on kill. That's how awesome <laughs> social media has been this week. Um, guys, it's, I know we're starting late, so let's just jump right into it, but I do have to say that regardless of, of what happens tonight, regardless of, of how things go and whether or not you guys end up kicking me off the show, I love you all. Just want to say that. Aw, we love you too, J.D. No, not you. Yes. I'm in the other oh, Damn it. <laughs> I'm touched. I'm touched. Uh, excellent. Yeah, we, um, we, we, we actually had a guest planned, and our guest had uh, something come up. So our guest is you, the Social Blade audience. We're going to be getting interactive and discussing several social media stories, including, and we want your input on this, including um, something that Jeff is going to talk about. Which yes. is what? Is search of course. Yeah, I'm kidding. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Before you, before you go on, you look, you look like you're supposed to be doing like an episode of MTV Cribs. Like this is where the magic happens. Like, <laughs> what am I looking for? What am I looking like? Magic. You look like you're in a crib. She's calling you a baby. <laughs> oh. Yes. Yes, indeed. She says you're in a crib. She says that Aaron says that, that, that you, are, you look like you're in a crib just as social media is in the search engine crib. Okay, that was a very awkward and, and, and nonsensical segue, but, but go ahead, Jeff. Well, nonetheless. Um, yeah, what I want to talk about tonight was the whole... Um, the, the idea of search engines and how search engines will change in the future uh, because of social platforms and the rise of social platforms. And in the, I kind of got inspired by talking about this actually by an article that, that J.D. wrote, um, I think, a week, a week ago, talking about, you know, um, SEO isn't dead in, in certain industries. Um, and, but, you know, all in all, you know, the search engines, um, I think, have evolved almost to, personally, I believe search engines have also uh, you know, evolve to become more of like an asking engine, um, where you know you go on and you a you a more or less ask questions, um, you know, to the search engine, trying to find a direct answer to them. Not necessarily searching per se, or what we traditionally think of the word search. You know, when I think of the word search, I th feel like there a uh, there needs to be an element of serendipity or an element of stumbling upon something, uh, and and. That type of searching is found more often on social platforms, such as Facebook, you know, Twitter, uh, and Dig, where you're actually going through and, and searching for information um, that others have provided, where search engines are more of becoming ask engines, where you are just asking, you know, you know how, two versus two, do you use T-O-O versus T-O, or how many leaders are in a gallon? And, you know, where, what place do search engines hold in the future, things are going more social. Things are going more network oriented, and I think I think the idea of 
um, you know, Google really trying to get into the social platforming with Google Me, the social networking uh, per se, with Google Me, and they're really desperately trying to put a hole uh, into the social social networking um, arena. Whereas, you know, uh, Facebook is launching their questions. I think we covered this a um, uh, a couple weeks ago. How Facebook is offering a, a service where you can ask a question, uh, which is how I believe search engines are being used now. So, um, do you all I believe they search that. engines? No, I think that, I thought they were still doing it. I thought they, I think they killed it or delayed it or something. Oh, oh they well, well, yeah. They may well, not. If I'm, I'm, I'm well, we'll Google. We go back. <laughs> <laughs> Google what happened to Google <laughs> Me. I already did. Well, Google what happened to Facebook. I'm looking for Facebook questions. Well, well, I, don't okay. see anything saying I think it's telling because I, I think we covered a couple, uh, well, I think a month ago, that Facebook um, referred people to more information than Google did. I, is it, am I correct on that? You're correct. Yeah. And, it, yeah. yeah, and it's showing that the power of these social networks. And as the, the social networks grow and keep growing in popularity, um, you know, what place do these search engines hold where there's no limit of social connecting? I would, uh, I would like to, to tackle that question with one sentence. And this is a sentence that um, I'm going to use in my next, my next seminar webinar. Um, it's one that just came to me. Thank you, Jeff. You, you brought it to me. But for me, I, I look as you search for facts and you socialize for opinions, basically. So the, oh, and as far as the two versus TRO, that's where you go to the oatmeal. So just FYI. But... Um, but as far as the, the distinction right now, you don't necessarily, like, if you, if you want to find an address or a phone number to a local barbershop, you don't go to Facebook. If you want to find reviews about the local barbershops, you go to Facebook. Or not necessarily reviews, but at least questions, if you're wanting to ask questions about it. You may still get the reviews from, from search. One of the, uh, the and I said it was only going to take one sentence, so I'm going to only add one more sentence. The distinction right now, the, the way that I see it between search and social, is that it's it's in the not so much even the implementation of the of the content, but the sourcing of it. Google looks for the authority. Social media looks for people that you trust. So it's either the authority being non individuals, but websites, whereas social whereas uh, social media looks for individuals who can answer those those questions for you. Well, I think that's what you know with Google Instant just coming out. And for those of you that don't really know what it does, it's basically going to have faster searches, smarter predictions, and instant results. When you type it in, it, it's supposed to actually have the answer for you before you're finished typing. Now, obviously, this is brand new, and a lot of people are saying, oh, it's not that fast, especially Ergo. But I do want to say that this is where I think our search engines are going. They're going to find a way, and I know that someone in the audience said it does kind of emulate Twitter, but I think this is where we're headed. I think that more people want it faster, more convenient, easier, and I think they're going to find a way to bring some socialization in there like Google has already bringing Twitter in. So I think that's what we're going to look at. But is, is, to answer the full question, is, uh, well, are search engines dying? I would say no, they are not. Even though Facebook has, has been popular with its searches and Twitter does well with its searches, I think it's 600 billion searches a day on Twitter. Um, I still think that the essentials are going to uh, of search engines like Google are still going to be needed, very much so. I know I use Google a lot, even though I, I spend well, a lot of time on Facebook. Okay, this is something that uh, you know I kind of tossed around in the, in my head. Uh, you know, Facebook has already conquered the harder part, which is coming up with a networking site. And if we, you know, Google has been you know been trying very hard to accomplish that. Um, you know, I, I do think Facebook uh, in the future will, will roll out something similar to a search engine type um, of product where there is an element of search involved which will um, make the traditional search engine um, obsolete. Um, you know, I think that, you know, Facebook will, you know, see, okay, we got the network, we got, we got the opinions, let's bring, you know, as J.D. put, the facts to it. Let's, let's implement our own search engine and, and link the social aspect straight into it, and that's just that's snuff out the, the traditional way we use search engines. Is that something that you guys would agree with? 
Ergo? I asked that once more? I was looking up uh, Google on Wolfram Alpha here. Okay. What I, what I, was, what I was saying was, you know, did you, did you hear it, Aaron? I did. I don't think, you know, I think with anything on the internet, you have to progress. And so I think snuffing out the old usage of, of search engines, I don't think that's what it's really about. I think it's more about um, evolving. And if us as a society have, have stated, and we have with the creation and the global invention of social media, we want a quicker connection. We want to be able to find things faster so we can spend more time doing other things. And that, that is separate from social media, but if they can find a way to connect us with people faster and quicker, and I'm sure that a lot of these search engines will end up going with, with location-based at some point. Don't, don't quote me on it, but I think that a lot of them will. But, you know, I think at the same time, that's not snuffing out the old way of, of doing searches. I just think that it's evolving. And that's what, that's what everything needs to do when there's a high demand of something, and that's, that's what we want. Hmm. Yeah, no, I, I definitely I don't think search engines are going anywhere either myself. I, I use Google many, many times every day, but I do think uh, I, I do hold a lot of stock in search engines like the Twitter search engine, though. Um, I, I use that probably almost just as frequently as, well, it, it's good for certain things. Like if I, I wanted to find out about a product or something like that, I, I would be more likely to go on Twitter search instead of Google search just to see what people are actually saying about it recently. Or if, uh, yeah. So basically, Ergo, your your searches within Twitter are going to be completely different than what you oh, would yeah. search for in Google. Absolutely, completely different. Uh, Google, I, I still use just as much as I always do for those type of things. But would you agree that social media platforms have taken away from search engines? It's a, it's a whole different ballgame, at least for what I use them for. I mean, you search on, uh, on the, the network there. Like I use YouTube search, for example, for any time I want to see any sort of video-related thing. Um, I use Twitter search for what I want to uh, if I want to hear what people are saying about something. He uses Google to yeah, and the reason why I, I use Google the to why. find information on things. Go ahead. Sorry, I interrupted you. No, I was going to say, just, you know, it kind of I just really got brought up... Um, you know, got kicking around in my head. You know, as as, as we move more to um, you know mobile, and when you when you know we're on the move and we're using these mobile devices, we're we're app based. We're we're accessing things directly through applications instead of going through something um, to essentially search for it. You know, do, do the how can I put it? as you can tell, I'm having this rhetorical debate with myself, and this this stuff is still rack on rolling around in my head. But I, I really do feel as we move more mobile, you know, more app based, more we have an app that directly takes us directly to something. I, I do feel that the traditional search engines will go away. Mm, I don't think so. Tammy Flores even says, and I agree with her, I find Google is a powerful research tool. And it is. If you wanna if you wanna write about anything and I mean talk about when we'll be talking about blogging later, it's a great tool for you to search anything that you want to talk about and be able to have resources and references to use with content that you're creating. I don't think that's going to go anywhere. I really don't. And I mean, what I, about uh, SEO purposes? Where would, what would happen to search engine uh, optimization if, if that, search engines were to go away? I don't, I don't think that that is a, a question that the general searcher cares about, honestly. I mean, absolutely, businesses care about Nobody that. Nobody cares about it. <laughs> businesses care about that, but, uh, I mean, <laughs> if I'm looking for something, I don't care about SEO. <laughs> no, but if you're a writer, if you're a blogger yourself, don't you care about how far you rank within yeah, search engines? I guess, but the person looking for something doesn't. No. Okay, that... And who uses a search engine? Well, you know what? That's not that's not entirely true because the thing is, and I'm sorry, JD, I don't mean to keep cutting you off. Just let me just let me finish. Oh, okay. So that's you not, can know, hear me. We can totally hear you, and we're just we're just being rude, <laughs> so I, I apologize. But it, uh, before we let JD go, we're we're going to just finish the sentence here. But I think that in a sense, probably not uh, right at the the tip of our tongues, thinking, oh, okay, or at the edge of our fingertips. 
okay, I care about SEO. But when we go to search on search engines, we're hoping that whoever has the content out there has the proper keywords. So when we search, they pop up. And so it is important to the actual honestly, I'm, searching. Honestly, I'm not hoping that they have the correct keywords. I'm hoping that Google did the correct analyzing of the site. And like crawling? Like keywords. authority? Exactly. Like the, le the legitimacy of the information? Yeah. So you are, you're hoping for something, though. Right. I'm not hoping that the person uh, technically optimized it to make it appear higher up in the results. I, I don't care if uh, the person did that or if it was someone that just wrote a good story, but, you know, just put it on uh, their blogger or whatever. And You're missing the point, though. It's not about the person or the blogger. It's about the search engine itself. If right. search engines went away then SEO would go away and we would need, we need that in order to find content. So whether it's, whether it's bloggers putting in keywords or if it's Google crawling it, we still need it. We still need are those search engines. Oh yeah. Yeah. I'm not arguing that. Yeah. That's what I'm saying. I, I mean, that's, that's the the it's not about ranking. Yeah. You need the search engine. You need Google to do their job. You don't need SEO to do that. That's all I'm saying. You don't need uh I, obviously, you know, it's a big business and uh, a lot of people care about it. But I'm just saying, again, from the from the web searcher, from someone looking for information, that's not what the end user cares about. That's all I'm saying. And I use web crawler all the time, Alexander, <laughs> or Alaska. Okay, so what was JD going to say? Yeah, go ahead. I have no idea. Oh, no. I'm sorry, <laughs> JD. That's okay. Did it have to do with, with search engine optimization? I don't recall. Gosh, that was so long ago. <laughs> <laughs> I lost it. Oh, well. Um, to me, the, the, the distinction is what's going to change. In other words, right now we say, you know, search engines, we, we look at social. I think that in the, in the not very too distant future, um, only one thing can possibly stop the natural evolution of either Google um, integrating in with social properly or social integrating in properly with search or um, basically the combination. The only thing that they, they can stop, in other words, basically in the very near future, you will be able to Google from Facebook, you will be able to, or you will be able to to update and and integrate completely with Facebook from Google, likely the prior, with an outside chance of there being a, a conglomeration of the two. Other companies have tried it, but really Google and Facebook control their own destiny and control the destiny of the rest of us. The only outside force that could ever change that would be antitrust laws um, kicking into effect from the U.S. government. Uh, if it, it won't even take the other countries to, to make that happen because they'll be able to allow uh, multiple integrations. The only way that they would ever it would ever be profitable for either or both would be for them to to basically get permission to do such a thing and bypass bypass um, you know the the law. Uh, and it's possible people say, oh, of course there, there would be no way to bypass the law. But because of what's at stake here, it would be very possible for if Google and Facebook joined hand in hand and went. And I'm not suggesting this is going to happen. I'm not trying to get into conspiracy theories. But I'm saying if they were able to go put a consolidated front together, go to Congress and say, look, there. here's the deal. We have, we have tons of data. We can take this data and we can make it available to everyone. We can even help smaller networks to achieve their financial goals. We're not doing this for the money. We're doing this for the sake of, of humanity because, quite frankly, the data, when you combine those, those two bits of data, actual factual data from Google as well as you know, other websites, and integrate that with the social media data available on Facebook and, and Twitter, suddenly you have basically Skynet, but hopefully with us having more control and not the creation of robots that will try to kill us. Um, I don't think it would ever happen, but I think that that's the natural progression. I mean, that's where, that's where everything's kind of pointing. Google is trying to get social. Facebook is trying to get, get searchy. And between the two of them, they both realize that it's going to be a stalemate. We're talking about a Cold War, you know, that's going to be up and down. It's going to be the U.S. versus the USSR where they could just take over the whole world um, and help the rest of the world if they were to get together. Again, this is speculation that I heard. 
um, not too, I guess it wasn't too long ago, but I mean, it was just speculation from, from people that were much, much smarter and better connected than I am. So um, I sat back, listened, and soaked it up and thought, you know what, it kind of makes sense. Um, kind of makes sense. That does make sense. There'll probably be a, a point where they're going to have to collide and, and we'll call team up Fugle. together. Fugle. Fugle. Wow. There's some stats here. Uh, who put this in the room? L. Hawkins put this in the room. Uh, apparently, searches on the different sites. There's 88 billion Google searches a month. There's 19 billion Twitter searches a month, which is pretty high up compared to Google's. Um, 9.4 yeah, billion keep mind, Google searches. The majority of Twitter searches are automated searches that are done oh, from uh, scraper companies looking for trends. Yeah. And not even scraper companies, even your TweetDeck, if you have just a, a search running for hashtags yeah, or something. TweetDeck's a scraper company. I mean, what I'm saying by scraper, and in other words, there aren't 19 billion people going to Twitter to, uh, to search for things. or 19, 19 billion instances of people searching on Twitter. Yeah. It's searches that are done for the compilation of data. Twitter is a the reason that everybody was so interested in Twitter, you know, six months to a year ago, and, and the reason technically they still are, is because Twitter is a gold mine of consumer data. Yeah. Okay. I mean, literally a gold mine. You want to know? You want to predict how well a movie's going to do? Twitter can do it for you. Yeah, I think we talked about yeah. that on the show. Yeah. yeah, I think we talked about that. You want to predict who's like if, if the election were tomorrow, who would win? Twitter can tell you who would win the 2012 election if it were tomorrow. Which I know that's kind of a time warp since 2012 is not tomorrow. But you know what I'm saying. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So anyway, so that's why. So don't don't be misled by that fact. It's Twitter's got the data, uh, and they will. And I have zero doubt. They've given it long enough. They've they've held their guns. They've done a great job. I love Twitter. I love using Twitter. Um, they're not going to be able to make the money they can make by simply selling themselves off to somebody. In my opinion. Mm -hmm. So I that's mean, a just whole, like whole. I'm sorry. Just like Tammy Flores says in the chat room, Twitter is like news. I don't get my news from Google and Twitter. Kind of lets you filter the news you want to hear. So Google, Google's more like you get um, information. I would say you get more information there, and then Twitter's more like breaking news. And that you can choose what you want to see, when you want to see it, where Google you really can at this point. Unless you, well, I don't know. What do you guys, I don't know. What do you guys think about that? What Tammy says. Well, I, Twitter, uh, I, I, get, I get my it's news quicker. from It's more up to date. Yeah, this is Google News right here. I got my news from Google. I mean, when earthquakes when earthquakes happen around the world, Twitter's the first one to break it. Yeah. I mean, and then you look, you you really quick over to CNN or you know whatever news station you go to, and there's not there's nothing on it yet. So, I mean, it, in terms of news, there's there's nothing better than Twitter. Twitter is for late breaking news. Well, there's Dig. Dig gives you. <laughs> there was Dig. Yes. <laughs> well, even Dig. Is, I mean, it, even Dig is you know lags behind Twitter. All right, look. When you say uh, world news on Dig, the last world news story was 14 hours ago, <laughs> and then the one before that was over a day ago. Well. So. Argo, nothing has happened in the world in the last Right. The, the he still. The last uh, news was uh, an asteroid was close to the Earth. <laughs> that was the last Oh, nice. News. <laughs> Did we get hit? Well, no, no, not so much. We <laughs> missed. <laughs> We're still here. <laughs> you would have uh, known about it on Twitter first. Nice. Yeah, Twitter. Twitter oh, is the <laughs> speed of Twitter, the data on Twitter. Before is, is the, before the Earth is destroyed and blown apart, you would see a tweet about it to know it's going to happen. Mm -hmm. You'll probably yeah. see hashtag hashtag oh. <laughs> Hash, hashtag see ya. Oh no, it's coming! It's yeah. coming! <laughs> <laughs> There's a meteor above my head. Goodbye. Actually, uh, Alaska Lone Wolf saying that uh, you can see the log off. From their house. You can cool. See the asteroid from your house? Do you, did you take pictures? That's pretty That'd cool. Be cool. Can you see Russia from your house? <laughs> <laughs> Hashtag one last party. <clears throat> nice. All right. Well, yeah. beat me up science because this next article that we're going to talk about is, well, the title says Location Determines Social Network Influence. And it's from the City College of New York which led uh, a team 
uh, of researchers, and the head of that that team was Her Hernan Max. I think I'm saying that right, or Mac C. I'm not sure, but he's a professor of physics at uh, the the college um, in New York. And as you can see on the screen, there is uh, a graph there, and it is actually called a node. And what a node is, in Latin, it means not. And it is a communication network. And there's three steps. So what you're looking at here is what you're seeing, the, outs the outer ring, so there's only three. There's the outer, there's the inner, and the cord, the core. And what they're trying to see is, uh, this is the kind of the funny thing, is how social networking, as well as what they can do for infectious diseases through this study. And so they're using uh, a K shell or a K core to find out how it works. And this can help marketers and it can help uh, people who want to promote using social networks. But this is where I kind of get confused. They're saying that the core, which is the orange, and it has the least type of network. So they say that the, it doesn't matter if you have like a thousand people. If you're not within the core, you're probably not likely to share it within your social network, so you're not part of that location. You're, if you're close to the core and you have 100, you're most likely to share information. And that's what the study is revealing, that if you're closer to the actual location, then you're able to share it m more than if you actually were outside of that location, even if you had more people outside of the location than within the location. But what they're trying to determine is how exactly do we get to that core so hold and on. be able to, just, to just share to, it? Just to translate this, so if there's an earthquake in California, the people around the earthquake are more likely to tweet about the earthquake than someone in North Carolina? Is that what you're saying? Right. And they're using physics to try to figure this out. And I mean, that's exactly right. If you're closer to the location, even if you have like one friend, you're more likely to, to share it across your social networks than if you live, let's say, in the, the next state of Nevada, then you're going to be like, even if you have, a, you know, a thousand friends, less likely to share it. And so they're trying to find out how they can, how they can program this core to be able to share it with marketers and to share it uh, with people to find out who their core is and how to target them. This is also what they're using, the exact same prototype with how to find out about infectious diseases, which I kind of find interesting. But, you know, I looked up um, a K shell, and, you know, it came up with a variety of different things, but I found this one interesting. The electron shells are labeled, you know, with letters and some numbers, and one of them is K, and it says going from innermost shell outwards. So that is pretty much what it's talking about here. So going from the innermost shell outwards, electrons in outer shells have higher average energy and travel farther from the nucleus than those in inner shells. This makes them more important in determining how the atom reacts chemically and behaves as a conductor because the pull of the atom's nucleus upon them is weaker and more easily broken. In this way, a given element's reactivity is highly dependent upon its electronic configuration. Thank God for Wikipedia. But basically, it's just those three steps, and the, what they've done is they've seen that even, and that's basically what it comes down to, is that even if you have a small fan base or a small um, a group of friends, if they're closer to your location or, or you're even in relation, not necessarily with your physical location, but relation to what you're talking about, then they have a higher chance of sharing it than somebody who doesn't. Does that make sense? Yeah. If I say yes, would you believe me? <laughs> right, I know. This is really scientific. I said this is what Jason should be covering. It's very scientific. And, I mean, uh, but it's interesting because I really would love to find out how they're going to figure out this core and be able to share it with, with uh, social media marketers and be able to share it with businesses. So, is it basically saying someone like happens exactly, I am more likely to share it than if, um, you know, the say I tell you it happened to me, you're not as likely to share it with your friends that, you know, whatever happened to me, you know, happened. Wow. Let me rephrase that. Obviously, the, the trip is taking a lot out of me mentally, apparently. So, so basically, when, when you're directly impacted, you are more likely to share Seems to your like friends. Common sense. 
Yeah, right. just go back to that graph for, for a quick second, if you could, Jason. It's up on the so basically, this K shell, what they're using here, are you able to bring it back up? Yeah, it's on the screen. You're delayed. Just keep talking. OK. Um, what they're basically showing here is that this, this is a K shell. That's, that's what it's called. And there's three types. There's the, the core, which is the orange. And then there's the inner, which is the green. And then there's the blue, which is the outer. The outer is least likely to share. And what they've seen here <laughs> using it. these different nodes, which is uh, communication networking, that you can see that from the, the orange, I know, Jason, you're going to kill me. I told you. But from the orange, you can see that there's that one link. And that one link is what makes the, the success. The, the ones that are the outer and the, the inner, they have more, do you see how they have more nodes? And so they're least likely to share where that one link is going to be, and that's the core. So in other sense. words, the real question is, do you have an any or an Audi? And I, I personally have an any. Awesome. Does that does it make any sense? Yeah, a lot no, of no it, it really does. It really, I mean, it sounds it's just common sense. I think here, I don't know why they have to study, but obviously, if something, if you were impacted, you know, if again, I'll bring up the earthquake thing. If an earthquake happened, <laughs> you felt it in your house, you're more likely gonna tweet about, "Hey, I just witnessed an earthquake." Your friends uh, in other places are like, okay, that's kind of cool. They're not going to necessarily retweet you, per se. And especially that's your not friend, true. Hold that's on, not true. That, because but, the but thing is, on, and I'm going to quickly explain that. It, it, they, they will, at least, you know, somewhat. But then your friends of your friends, uh, you're way outside here. Are, or it's the other people right. that experience. Yeah. It's the other people that experience that particular, that same exact, you know, earthquake that will share that information. Right, mean, and that's it's a, it's upon relation as well, not just it's physical location. Right. So, for instance, when when JD experienced uh, the earthquake that he experienced, I did share that, and I asked him, you know, if he was okay. But that's because I have a relationship, as you know, a friendship with JD, and so right. I degrees, care. And six, so that's uh, I'm not I'm nowhere close to California. I'm six, in Canada. Six degrees of separation. You know, you care right. about your friends. Six, you, you don't care as much about your friends. Uh, friends he and, Facebooked it, by the way. He didn't tweet it. He said, we're having an earthquake right now. And then he, that's when he left. He actually, he put it into Facebook. Then he got out of the house. Like I said, if there was an asteroid coming, the same thing would happen. <laughs> well, let's hope. <laughs> exactly. Uh, Alaska Lone Wolf will uh, let us know. Let's follow him on Twitter. <laughs> nice. Well, I mean, in, this is, you know, one of the things where, where social media, and we, we covered it earlier, how Twitter is, is the news Twitter is your your source for for what's happening right this very second um, and the search engines just are not they're they're not what's happening this very second they don't even know what's happening sometimes you know a while back but it just goes to show that that this data this my statement of the facts are coming through through Google may not necessarily be correct um, factual I don't know I mean I'm gonna have to rework that because that's you, you you're you're throwing doubt uh, as just just throwing everything that I know has just been turned upside down, um, very similar to what happened over at Dig the last couple of weeks, and uh, and uh, yeah, that's pretty pretty big throwing upside down in this. Would you agree? <laughs> yeah. My earth? No, no, you you're absolutely right there, and um, <laughs> we, we all know we all know about the new site uh, that they launched um, about a week or so ago, well, two weeks now. It's been a little while, but uh, they. <laughs> Dig has been having so many problems with it since day one. And the, one of the things they kind of did here, it came up in the news, I think, yesterday, day before yesterday, they actually let go their head of engineering. Um, their, or sorry, their VP of engineering. This is Harold John Quinn. And, I mean, it, first off, someone had to take the blame for this. But uh, I was actually watching because uh, Kevin Rose you know, does the show Dignation, and I'm – not a big fan of it in general, but I, I, he did have a big thing about Dig that he talked about uh, on this week's one, so I did watch that. And actually, just listening to it was kind of scary. So I just have a couple of quotes from there I wanted to just read off to you. 
So it's a conversation between Kevin and Alex here. So Kevin goes, even up until days before the launch, we were squashing major bugs that were causing, Alex cuts off, and bugs with the whole architecture, not bugs with your execution on the architecture. In other words, underlying problems. Kevin goes, right, Cassandra problems, which is their database that they're running the site on. And um, they, he was, Kevin then says, we were having data corruption problems and there were some issues. So basically <laughs> what that summarizes to is they noticed or they were having th these issues with their database. And I mean, theoretically, they didn't get these fixed and they knew that they were having all these issues. And yet they still went live with it. And this guy, John Quinn, apparently was the leader behind the whole Cassandra movement, which uh, high level, my, traditionally on the Internet, MySQL or MySQL, however you say it, uh, is the database that people use. Cassandra is sort of this new database that people are switching to or at least looking at. But it's still definitely at the early stages and there's lots and lots of bugs with it. Um, and... Basically, they saw these things and they decided to go live with it anyway. So, uh, John sort of got the boot. The boot. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, so did he tell Kevin or tell the rest of the data team everything good to go? I ready mean, to launch? or was he the one who said no, don't launch it? And Kevin says no, we're going with it. It, the the story here does not really say that I, I don't I haven't seen any details um, <laughs> about that it, it was just you know it, when Kevin was talking about this on Dignation Kevin Rose uh, if you're living under a rock he's the CEO of the website Dig dot com or not anymore what? he's the founder of it former yeah anyway um, he the the episode he taped was taped before John was let go so he he said all these things he didn't say that. Uh, it, from what it sounds like, it sounds like everyone knew about it, and they just decided to go anyway. But maybe right. that's not the case. I, I'm, I'm really not certain on that. Well, and and for those who don't know, um, Jason was not trying to be insensitive to any of you who who actually do reside below a a rock. Um, <laughs> that's a. That it was just a, it was just a colloquialism. If if you are one of our listeners who. Who's currently underneath the rock is no offense to you. We weren't trying to. We accept you the way you are. Well, we were talking about asteroids, and I, I mean, we might all be under a rock pretty soon. We're all we're all under a rock. We're just another brick in the rock, another another stone rolling, stone rolling in the wind. Um, to we're me, all, it's all dust in the wind. When I heard, yeah, when I heard about this, and and I heard about this from Ergo, but it it, it reminded me of like um like a like a kitchen at a restaurant. And uh, you got the the cook saying saying ah oh, but you know the the chicken it's not done and somebody's saying it doesn't matter serve it mm. you know and then now they're getting mad because um, you know because the they serve the chicken it was undercooked and now everybody's complaining about salmonella po poisoning not that I'm trying to equate um, dig to salmonella or anything like that or the problems that they're having because that's a serious issue whereas dig is not necessarily a serious issue but I just want to just clearly state that. That it's not something, and Jason can expound on this more. This is not something that you do. If your product's not ready, you delay it. You don't. You don't. You don't unleash it when you and basically know that it's going to have problems. And they did know, you know, or at least they experienced it. You know, they could have pulled the plug at the beginning. And as as uh, the part that I was able to hear from the from Dignation was that basically people were saying, you know, revert back, revert back. And he said, we just couldn't. In other yeah, words, they had made the transition over. That is the weirdest thing. I, I don't understand why. I mean, whenever I, I, I work in a technical environment, and one of the things that you always have is a rollback plan. Sure. It surprises the only me reason, to the extent they didn't have a rollback plan. It's, to me, it seems like, and this could be, you know, and I, I, I have experienced this, and I will, I'm, not, I'm not proud to say that we had a very similar situation uh, a couple years ago. And it was, you know, we, um, and when I say similar, it was literally we went from one platform, transferred to another platform. It was disastrous, not disastrous, but it was, there were, there were some definite mistakes and bugs made. And as a result, um, we got rid of the equivalent of our head engineer. You know, we, we, we checked, we said, okay, uh, is this going to work? Yeah, everything's going to work. It should work fine. We may experience some bad things, but, but we'll be able to work through them. And so to me, the fact that they let him go, I don't, I'm, I'm not going to sit here and say, oh, they had to blame somebody. 
I would rather I would assume and hope that um, that the, the the team over at Dig to to let go of such a high high ranking and important person they had valid reason. In other words, they probably went in. I couldn't imagine Kevin, you know, saying coming out and 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 going with it and rolling this out had he had any clue. Well, how many bugs? The, the, to Kevin's uh, defense, <laughs> well, okay, yeah, to his defense, they, they did switch to this platform. Maybe it was a bad idea, but if uh, they were using a beta database and they thought that they ironed out the last one, even though it was a couple of days before, but regardless, if, it, if they just thought that this was just going to keep going on forever and they just had to take a risk, I mean, yeah, they... I don't know. I, I still think it's a bad idea, but I mean, to his defense, he, if he didn't roll now, maybe he thought that they would never roll. I could imagine that this wasn't a case of, of I would hate to think that this was a, well, you know, it's now or never kind of deal. That would be very, well, very no, bad, and yeah. that would be a poor decision. And, and, and in that case, the, the, it would be the person who pulled the trigger more so than the, the, the person who designed it who should be at fault. I can see it more likely as, look, guys... It's not 100% ready, but it's 98% ready. We're going to have bugs. We're going to have a better... We're, we're going to be able to deal with them more easily on the fly in a live environment than anything we do. You know, it's, it's, in other words, we need to see what happens once we go live, and that will bring out more bugs, and we can, we can address them very quickly. And obviously, the fact that, that on you know, hours after launch, they're out buying servers, <laughs> we need to believe that... That you know they were, in my opinion, I'm hoping again. I'm hoping this is the case, but that the the powers to be were misled, or not, maybe not misled, but at least they were they were um, led into this with underestimated um, expectations of the of the amount of problems. I think that if they knew that there were going to be these, these these kinds of problems, in other words, I guess what I'm saying is they listened to the expert. The expert told them. That we can handle the the workload in a live environment, or not the workload, but the uh, the challenges in a live environment, and as a result, um, they they rolled with it, and we see what happened as a result of the result. Check it out, check it out, JD. We found the bug. Uh, they can get rid of the bug now, and all will be well. They what? They found the bug? Look at the screen. Oh, there's a screen. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, we found the bug. I don't see this. Oh, hold on. I gotta. <laughs> Expand. I'm sorry. I'm so ill prepared for the screen itself. It's, it's screen. all right. Don't worry about it. I'm going to the screen now. You got. Oh, there's the bug. Oh, that's a big bug. <laughs> I'm yeah. That's important. Love and it. And that is actually Kevin Rose right there, <laughs> screaming like a little girl. <laughs> he didn't drag. <laughs> so. so, anyone else have anything left to say about bugs? <laughs> Alaska Lone Wolf is going to email that to Kevin Rose. <laughs> <laughs> you were in bed with a bug last night. <laughs> uh, so, oh, is just one cool. last thing that I thought was kind of funny also from <laughs> that interview there. Uh, well, uh, yeah, so Kevin also said that uh, either Dig will end up rebounding from this or will shrink in size. Dig eventually might just fizzle out, but you got to take risks. <laughs> no. mm. Nice job. Yeah, I don't know. He he said twice that it might fizzle out, um, basically <laughs> in that segment. So I don't know. He doesn't sound like he has that high hope or those those high. I, I can't even. It just seems like he just wants to be done with it and start something new. Yeah. Mm. Oh, I would. You know, Kevin. I, I can tell you this much, and, and I've studied his personality very well for, or not very well, I don't know how well I've studied it, but I've attempted to study his personality. We're talking about Kevin Rose, right? Yes. Right. Study his personality. J.E. Rucker. Oh, he, yeah, he definitely <laughs> does. He wants to end it and move on to the next thing. Um, my next job will be in waste management. So, um, my first assignment is dig. No, don't go there. So, um, no, my assessment of, of Kevin Rose is that he wants desperately for Dig to be fun, that he's not necessarily interested in it ever becoming huge, but that he wants it to be self-sustaining, profitable, and he wants, I mean, this, after all said and done, he's tried to build a legacy off of other things. His legacy is Dig. 
even if he moves on next month, you know, if I guess what his to me his goal is that he wants Dick to succeed so desperately that he could leave if he wanted to, or take on a lesser role, which would be more likely, be the founder and um, and techno technology uh, um, consultant, making a nice nice salary, but you know, working three hours a week, and in the meantime, enjoying life and starting starting new projects, having fun, you know. And not having fun like I think that the image of of him being like this party party frat boy, I think that's um, not a fair statement. I think that in reality he he wants to be um, a creator mm -hmm. of innovative technologies. Yeah, he yeah. wants accounts to work. He wanted we follow to work, and to to some extent we follow has been. You know we follow's done exactly what it was supposed to do. He wants to do other stuff. He wants to, you know, and but he won't do that until his baby, which is Dig, until his baby is a success and can stand on its own two feet without his day-to-day -day input. Yeah. He that, said that he hated being CEO. He, he wouldn't wish, wish the job onto his worst enemy, so he plucked somebody out of Amazon and, and, and stuck him the job. But luckily that person had business experience, had, had, been, had led a company in the past that ended up getting bought by Amazon and um, had led several, several departments within Amazon to success. So um, there's very little known about Matt Williams. I'm still trying to get him on the phone. He won't return my calls. Matt, if you're watching... Call me, call me. But um, but yeah, I mean, I I just don't see him as a guy that's that's just wanting to bail. You know, if he wanted to bail, he would have bailed before Jay. <laughs> you know what I mean? He would have bailed a year ago. Um, he doesn't need Dig for the money. He doesn't need Dig for the for the fame. You know, if he quit Dig this time last year and started something else, then he probably would be successful at it, and he would be just as much in the limelight today as he was before. I don't see him like that. He's sticking it out until he knows the dig is going to succeed and going to be a a powerhouse. Not necessarily to get huge. Um, sure, it'd be nice to get it to Twitter status or or above, but get it to at least the point to where it's relevant and talked about in mainstream media. Then he can move on. My opinion. And I haven't any. So now we know the future of dig. Aaron, what's the future of blogs? That is a good question. Well, Mashable recently had a contest that only lasted for five days, uh, and it was for Mash Bash that's taking place at Blog World this coming October What's Blog 14th World? to the 16th. Blog World is a huge social media convention. A lot of people might think that it's just for blogs, but it's not. It's for social media. And uh, anyways, they were they had a contest going uh, to win ticket a ticket. Only five people could win. A full access ticket to Blog World, as well as an exclusive invite to Mashable's Mash Bash party. And so, of course, I entered it, and I won, which is awesome. But awesome. I do want to post. It's awesome. I'm I'm psyched. Shocking. Which shocking. <laughs> JD keeps trying to get me to sell it. Um. My answer to the question, the, what is the future of blogging? And this is my answer, and, I, and then I want to know your guys' answer, because that's what we really want to know. Is, this, is, is blogging dying, or, or is there a future for it? And this is what I put. The future of blogging will make more of a transition from a personal, a personal aspect to a business-oriented platform, which will assist businesses with personalizing themselves. Blogging is still and will continue to be an integral part of social media. Although people love the quick char characters of Twitter and the paragraphs on Facebook, they still seek and yearn for more places to connect and articles that help them relate to the online communities they have chosen. I think businesses will capitalize on this knowledge as more industries jump aboard the social media train. In the future, more blogs will be seen on websites and act as a sidekick or personality of the business. Blogs will also be a great forum to share their other online participation from YouTube videos and photos that will enhance their online presence. Businesses and blogging in the future will go hand in hand as means to suffice their community's demands of having the ability to communicate and connect. The continuing strength will propel businesses into the blogging sphere to ensure their communities are being supplied with ample locations of engagement. Yes, many people have taken to blogging and differentiating between who is what and what is credible anymore has become null. However, that is a part of the transformation of what blogging was to what it is becoming, which is switching from dominating writers to hoping they get readers to dominating readers hoping there are writers. Our society is always looking for ways to connect and blogging can be a great outlet to do this. 
That is why the future of blogging is bright for businesses and in the continuation of the reason social media was formed, allowing people to engage with people. This is just another example of why businesses will utilize blogging as a way to increase their SEO, improve their online reputation, and maintain their presence while personalizing their business and connecting with their consumers through blogging. This is the future of blogging, which has already, be, which has already begun today and will seep well into our tomorrows. That this is what I think the future. This is what I said it. <laughs> That's Man. what you said, people? I did. Are you gonna yes. get, are you gonna, gonna, that was yeah. awesome, Aaron. Are you gonna Thank get up you. on stage? Are you gonna get up on stage and read that there? They should sure. I, I would love that. If they have that if they give you the opportunity to that, I would love to. That is what I think the future of blogging is. I think it's going to go more business oriented. But I wanna know what you guys think. Let me know what you think. Which I mean, it's interesting to see where blogging is now compared to where it was in the beginning, where, you know, jur you know journalists w would look at bloggers as, you know, people who just sing in their basement, you know, uneducated, just punching away at the keyboard, um, and almost like the black sheep. And now, you know, bloggers have I mean, come, come so far that it is more of a publishing platform. And I, I, I mean, I completely agree with what you, what you think the future of blogging is. I mean, it just looks, I, I mean, even, you know, a couple of years ago, it was okay to have typos and okay to like, uh, you know, you, you grammar didn't have to be that, you know, that put together, and you, you could, you know, make some, you know, mistakes. But now, if you if you make spelling mistakes and grammar mistakes, I mean, it, you, you just can't. I mean, people tear you apart. I mean, it, it, it's really different that people are looking for uh, more professional style blogs. Um, can't provide that. You know, go to go to Tumblr. Yeah, no, right. I I think you you bring up a, a good point there, and. I don't know. To me, a lot of blogs aren't really blogs to me. I, I still think, at least in some sense, that a blog is someone's you know own thoughts on something. And it, maybe we need a new term or something for these professional things, like gadget, uh, uh, Huffington Post, things like that. Don't feel like blogs to me, even though that's really what they are at the core. They're still technically considered that, but they're sure. really they're news sources and. I don't know. Maybe it, that's just my take. That I don't think that they should be even called blogs. I uh, I hold on. Go ahead, go ahead, JD. What's interesting though is I think they're going to. Sorry. No, go ahead, go ahead, Aaron. <laughs> well, say, that was in <laughs> I was going to say I think in the future you're going to have to see a little more. Um, uh, how can I put it? You know, fact checking or reference checking instead of having somebody be becoming more publishing platforms become, because they're becoming places where actual newspapers are referencing them. Um, I think there's going to have to be more of, okay, well, you wrote about this specific topic. Where are your facts? You know, where is it backed up? You know, it, and, you know, I think we have, because more people are diving into this, just you know, spewing tons of information. Where's the fact checking? You know, you, you know what I'm saying. With that? I do know what you're saying, but I think that you know, for any blogs to be successful, they have to have the facts. I don't think that any blogs out there that are truly successful um, are just. I mean, besides personal, and I mean that's the thing with blogs. There's so many different types of blogging, but I, that's my opinion. I mean, I think that. With blogging and and fact checking and everybody trying to to give a source of news, if it's credible and and you can trust that type of blog, that's when it becomes popular. If it's not, it's this, just going to just going to say. Let's take like a political blog. You know, whether they be the right or the left, and those political blogs will um, you know attract you know you know let's just say it's it's a conservative blog. A conservative blog is going to attract conservative people. And even if those facts are not correct, the conservative people will believe those facts, and they're not going to believe the other facts of that blog if they really respect that blog. But that blog is going to do a disservice to the community because it's not getting the facts straight, and it's and it's doing a disservice to the you know community at large because it's misinforming you know people to uh, you know believe something that's not true. Well, I mean, we should say the same thing about Twitter then. If Twitter gives breaking news, then it's like, 
how do we know it's actually real breaking news? Well, it's not how, Twitter. Where's the fact? Oh, exactly. It's not Twitter I mean, that's getting yeah, That's on Twitter. It's who you're following on there, or the news source you're following. I mean, if you were TV, you're legitimate. And now that has almost trickled into if you're a blogger you know, with a community, you're legitimate. You know, right. If you have Twitter with lots, you know, lots of followers and you get lots of retweets and you, and you have you know, a huge cloud score or whatever, you're legitimate. So people are going to see what you're talking about and take it and say, okay, that's a legitimate, that, that's, you know, there's no, um, there's no challenge. There's no, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, uh, you know, the word, the word has slipped me. Um, well, while you think of the word, I'll say that every now and then I still tweet out that Jeff Goldblum has died. Accountability, <laughs> that's it. Accountability. That is the word I'm looking for is accountability. Thank you very much. You're welcome. I'm, I'm glad I was able to help. It, so um, how many times has home. he died now, JD? Huh? How many times has he died? Uh, every day. Oh, sweet. He's like he's like Kenny. <laughs> <laughs> but that's a, I mean that is a really good question, Jeff. But I mean the thing is is that like for instance when Ergo hears of like a big huge news uh, story, he doesn't just read what what was on that blog post. He will actually do a search in those search engines we were talking about earlier and see if other people are talking about it. If there's other credible sources, then he's able to say, oh, that's probably true then. Blogging just, is the distinction today. I'm sorry. The, when, when, uh, and I agree with you. Um, when earlier Ergo said that you know, he still looks at it as a blog, in other words, you, I'm assuming or you don't consider Engadget having to post, those, you don't consider them blogs anymore, even though that's what they're technically called, right. correct? Right. Right. I would think that, in my opinion, that um, the distinction between blogs and traditional journalistic um, um, arenas, so to speak, uh, uh, venues, that the distinction isn't so much that we need to call them something other than blogs. I think that blogs in and of themselves have become, have become classifiable. In other words, for a long time there was just the news, and then there became tabloid journalism. And then they're then they're they're turned into uh, you know um, specific style magazines like like TMZ and I'm talking about like television shows. If you look at the transition that, that journalism itself has made from general news with different sections to actually turning into where newspapers would would be co would come out specifically for a particular topic, um, they were they were topical. You know, just because somebody took a piece of paper and put something on it didn't mean that it was a newspaper, even if they considered it news. So I guess what I'm saying is, in my opinion, the distinction shouldn't necessarily be to change change the term blog, but to redefine it into different particular types. Like, like, and I do this myself already. You know, when I when I talk about Mashable, TechCrunch, and Gadget, um, having to post anything like that, I call these mainstream blogs. That's that's my own personal term that I use in my head that I refer to. These are these are mainstream go. blogs in that they've made that transition to where occasionally and, and actually quite often they get the scoop on mainstream media um, on when it comes to a piece of brand new that fill with then you look at <coughs> excuse me um, so, and those are also sites that I consider ones that were updated on on multiple occasions every day then I go into that next level of blogging where um, you know there there there's good writing it's it's factual it's uh, it's uh, checked journalistically. It has it has strong opinions. They have basically paid writers involved with it, um, and they they post us uh, you know daily, maybe multiple times a day, maybe maybe once every day, or maybe once every couple of days. And those ones are are, are very are high volume. I know of a couple that are posting you know one story a day and getting a million unique visitors a month. And these are blogs that are built around this individual individual niche. Um, I would call those major blogs, so to speak. And then you've got the, you know, stuff like, like my sites. These are minor blogs that are, you know, I update them once or twice a, a week. Um, thankfully, Aaron's updating my one of mine more often. So uh, so hopefully we'll get more than two or three stories a month in there. <laughs> hopefully. Um, but, yeah, so so I guess what I'm saying is that I don't think there's a distinction anymore between, the, between journalism and blogging. I think that the distinction needs to be made in the classifications within the blogs themselves. Uh, rather than calling it something other than a blog, because a blog is a web log, and that's by definition, that's technically what all of these are. Huffington to post is a web log. It's a highly profitable, highly circulated, highly read, um, uh, liberal political web log. 
you know, how it's, is, how it's is not. It yeah. There's there's how, no ABC <laughs> behind it. There's no CNN behind it. You know, they they don't go out. They don't have a, a newsroom where they they send people out across the country. They get people. Um, in many cases, they get celebrities to come uh, to come on and blog for them. They do have paid writers. You know, TechCrunch. You know, you can't compare Tech TechCrunch will sometimes scoop um, and not sometimes will often scoop. CNN or or New York Times or any of these traditional mainstream sites, um, they'll get the the, the the stuff first when it comes to technology. Um, and the last time I checked, I don't know if this has changed. But last time I checked, you know, the office literally out of Michael Arrington's basement. He converted into a four-person office. You know, you couldn't run the New York Times out of an office. So I guess what I'm saying is this: that we might not see a distinction as your average everyday reader. A story that we see on TechCrunch might hold as much weight. As something that we see on the Chicago Tribune, but in reality, one is mainstream and one is blog. It's just a very high volume, um, well funded, and um, and a lot of passion and energy has gone into turning that into, you know, into a very huge and uh, influential blog. And that's all I have to say about that. No, I think you. I think that makes great sense. But I also think that you know a lot of even websites are going for a blog kind of style look because it makes them look more sociable. Um, Yoon puts in, in the chat here, well, when Aaron was talking about business blogging, they really need to blog more often than once or twice a year. I completely agree. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Like once um, or twice a week. I gave a seminar this weekend. Not a seminar, but I, I did a, in my conference this weekend, I was showing businesses um, it was a, a literally, and this was the beauty of it because it was able to tie in Google and that as well. It, uh, so we sat there, and I took a you know okay if you're a business, um, if you're a business, then <laughs> sorry I just got behind you I was like oh my gosh up there. Um, if you're a business, then here's what you can do: take a video. And I actually walked out there with a video camera and took a video of a guy and asked him about what he thought of my presentation so far. I took that video and I put it on the blog. On the blog, um, I put in, a, I embedded the video and I put in a uh, a paragraph describing what was happening. I then took that blog post and um, uh, sent it out through Facebook and Twitter. I took the the link to it and put it on on Dig and Reddit, and um, that was it. And I said, "Look, guys, you just you know, I was able to post a, a customer testimonial blog post." Um, relevant to people that will be visiting my blog um, and I did that in about nine minutes and then eight minutes later it's ranked on the front page of Google for the term that we were actually going after. This to me guys, from a business point perspective, this, that's, that's, that's how you do it. And then that's not what you do 100% of the time. There's got to be times when you're not just about yourself. There's got to be times where you're not just putting up a video and a paragraph. If you're going to be blogging, put up stuff that people can use. Put up tips on how to use your product or how to use your service. Um, put up, you know, long, you know, case studies, testimonials, uh, tips, tricks. There's so many things that you can blog about if you're a business. I am getting on my soapbox, and I really need to come down as the show can go on for so long because I can just keep talking nonstop without even breathing sometimes. We, we enjoy your rants, though, J.D. They're very educational. But, I mean, you're right. You're completely right, and that's what you want to do throughout your area, any social network. And, you know, that's why blogging is so great, because you can use your other social networks on that blog. You can also use, if you have a website, a link to that blog. Uh, you can create a story to a video that you've made. And, Jason, I know you were going to talk a little bit about vlogging. You think that's the future, right? Oh, I mean, not necessarily. Well, a future maybe of uh, the other style and that, you know, personalized, because it's easy for anyone just to get on a camera and just talk rather than typing up everything so uh, and especially if Google have you drinking their Kool-Aid and uh, Google TV is coming out uh, competing with Apple TV but um, Can't wait. I mean, you'll be able to have YouTube on your TV soon so everyone will be doing it I think what, what definitely has started to go away is what we think of as the traditional press release especially with how businesses are using blogging you know you have to be more personable when you blog, and I think you know the traditional press release um, is something that is starting to to fade away. Hmm. Because of it. I don't know because a lot of those blogs are you they use press releases for content. 
Yeah, but just press release. This, I mean, a lot of consumers nowadays don't want to hear the, you know, the uh, upper echelon executive jargon. You know, they they want their they want their business to, to be more personable, to be more, you know, down to earth. You know, the average Joe. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I think the traditional PR or that press release is starting to go away, where you aren't just setting one up, you know, press release. You're you're writing continually, keeping your customers up to date in a more, um, you know, conversational manner. Right. Than just that one direct, you know, like just one way, just a one way communication. Yeah, I mean, that's the, one of the questions in the audience from Unigen. A lot of those expert business bloggers tell businesses not to blog anything of a personal nature. Yay or nay? I say yay, but socially professional. So combine it together and you know you want to make sure that you're appeasing your audience with information like if if you have this is information, yeah you know you want to you want to yeah that's a good way to put it definitely you want to make sure that it's that it's friendly and 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 informative at the same time more so exactly. than just it used to be just let's just inform 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 and kind of like push things down people's throats and now it's like Give them an opportunity to respond. So you need to you need to word things differently now. I think that's that's what it comes down to. But I think there's a great future ahead for blogging. And would love to thank Mashable. So I'm hoping to see them at Blog World this October. Let's hope. Fingers crossed. Definitely. Yeah. Well. I think that uh, kind of wraps up the show here. So I wanted to thank. <laughs> we don't have a guest to thank, so <laughs> thank you, thank you guys all for uh, joining us here. You're, you have been a great audience as always. Oh yeah. Yeah. I also want to. Oh yeah, we we need to announce uh, or reannounce. Uh, it was a suggestion last week that we were going to have a logo contest, and uh, if you check out our our blog. <laughs> socialblade.com slash show, you'll see a link to that there. We're having a contest. We want your logo suggestions. Uh, draw us up something if you have uh, that creative talent there. And uh, we'll, basically, the contest is running until September 25th. So you got a couple of weeks to submit your logo to uh, thesocialblade at gmail.com. And Don't, it better be good or we'll ridicule you live. Absolutely. <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> JD, you're a scary one. Yeah, oh, but I, I do want to say that what's included is we're going to be announcing soon um, what you'll win, but you'll also have a written interview of how you came up with the logo, and we're going to send out a signed T-shirt of the Social Bladers. You, you will win Aaron's ticket to Blog World. Oh, yeah. <laughs> we keep trying to give it away, I'm telling you. If Horrible. someone submits yeah. a really, really good logo. <laughs> if right we use your logo prior to Blog World, then we will buy you lunch at Blog World if you're able to come. <laughs> that, that, <laughs> that works. Yeah, have lunch with that. <laughs> yes. yes. We'll buy you a, a Caesar's Palace buffet, mm. which if anyone has not had the buffet at Caesar's Palace, I highly recommend it. It's worth every bit of the $24 that, it's, that it costs. I'm talking lobster, crab, uh, yeah. prime rib, the I works. Understand. It's just a wonderful. Oh, I could just go off on the face. I'll, I'll so you, you just ate too, which is weird. But you even says here, you know, maybe Aaron can ask uh, someone at Blog World a question for me. That would be kind of cool. You know, if I do get to go, I will actually ask you guys to have questions for me to ask people. And I will videotape it and, and share it on our YouTube channel. That the sounds winner? like a good idea. The winning logo will get to make one request of Aaron at Blog World that she is not allowed to deny. <laughs> uh oh. And we will <laughs> video it. <laughs> so if it's Aaron um, streaking through Leo Laporte's panel, so <laughs> be awesome. I, I, I can be clever. So, Maybe I'm buzz. so, so if, if that if that happens, we'll make sure that we tweet about it live at. Twitter.com slash social blade, right? And we'll have a video on our YouTube page. At YouTube oh, yeah, there would be major coverage, major coverage for, for you guys that aren't able to attend. I would try to make it as if you guys were there with me. Nice. 
and, and lastly, we'll definitely have all the footage and everything posted on our Facebook.com slash Social Blade page as well. But in the meantime, please enter the contest. We have we have some entries thus far, but we want more. So if you can send it to uh, the social blade at gmail.com, we'd appreciate it. We'd love to see what you guys would come up with as a logo for us when we launch our new uh, site. Ba, 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 ba. Yes. So while you're on our website reading about that, don't forget also that you can also suggest a guest to be on the Social Blade show that we can grill and have a great time just chatting with. So do that right we up above. Grill. Yes. <laughs> grill. Not like cook. I grill, <laughs> like ask a lot of questions, but then I didn't want it to sound really bad. So Where were you on the night of October ah! 14th, 2008? <laughs> oh, God. Oh, God. I'll have to check my blog. <laughs> <laughs> no. Check check your Foursquare. <laughs> check my four, that's actually more accurate. Yes, uh, except for Foursquare didn't exist back then. But good except try. For me since I forget Foursquare. <laughs> yeah. So I definitely have, suggest a guest, and also check out all our, our past stories because uh, Aaron and Jeff and JD, you guys have been writing a lot of great news stories there, which are definitely credible. They are. Go. Yes. So. JD, and we have a sponsor. Social.com slash show when anything happens with YouTube because Ergo is right on it as well. That's true. Whenever there's breaking news about YouTube or Twitter, I'll, I'll be posting it on there. JD, who's our sponsor? Is that our sponsor behind you? Um, our sponsor is my son who just walked through the background. Um, <laughs> yeah, you're live on the air. You need to <laughs> you need to back up there, son. You need five, my five bucks back. Um, this should, today, 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 tonight, today, today's show, get out of the screen. Today's show is brought to you by our wonderful sponsor, LightspeedNow.com. Excellent. And no, I did not pause. That was for dramatic effect, not because I had to think of the name of our sponsor. <laughs> Thank you, Lightspeed Now. Yes. And our other sponsor is us, Social Blade. <laughs> you can sign up for uh, SMSs from Social Blade <laughs> at j.mp slash subus where you can get notifications when Social Blade goes live, as well as some of our other favorite shows. These, the Drill Down, which airs, when does Drill Down air? 9.30 p.m. Eastern on Wednesdays. Ask Outcast, which uh, Little Birdie told me that they're going to be renaming themselves pretty soon uh, and adding another person. So look forward to that, but uh, at least at the moment, still scheduled for 8 p.m. on Tuesdays, Eastern. And then Band on the Web, which is on Tuesdays at 10 p.m. Eastern. So. I heard that they were going to be renaming. They're, they're trying to get a, a bump in uh, traffic, so they're going to be the, uh, renaming it Ask Alyssa Milano. Ooh. <laughs> that, that's... And every time anybody asks a question, they'll tweet at Melissa Mil Alyssa Milano <laughs> and uh, see if she answers. <laughs> awesome. So, you know, that would actually be a decent feature. That would be a really decent feature to have in the show. We'll have one, one guest or one, uh, one member of the audience pick out a question to ask a celebrity, and we'll tweet that celebrity from Social Blade live during the show and see if they respond to that question. That would be interesting. We are on the cutting edge, J.D., the cutting edge. New feature. New feature. So, uh, so uh, yeah, everyone, everyone uh, at uh, at reply to Social Blade on Twitter at Social Blade and uh, suggest your celebrity guest uh, over the next several days before our next show, and we'll get them on as our question segment. Yes, exactly. Tweet short and Facebook. Mm. All right, everyone, yeah. Thank everyone you so much for for coming yes. and interacting with us. We'll see you next Thursday. Wow. Next Thursday, 7 p.m. Pacific, 10 p.m. Eastern. And, J.D., who are we? We are JD. Social Blade. <laughs> we are Social Blade. We are. Are we? Are we Social Blade? <laughs> we are Social Blade. <laughs> <laughs>